Okay, so today what we are going to discuss is the love gone bad idea. And I will remind you what we were discussing, or maybe you will remind me what we were discussing last time during the last lectures and seminars. I mean, for my part. <laughs> so we were discussing a political concept of love uh, that Antonio Negri and Michael Hart introduced. And if you want, you can give me, if you remember, you can give me the definition of political concept of love. Can you? Anyone? As far as I remember, they suggest that love is uh, a necessary concept in modern political thinking because it implies the uh, unification of people, but not on the basis of just uh, similarity and unification in, in a bad sense, but rather something that we all share and uh, uh, that this is the basis for new um, uh, organisms or unities we can uh, we can create because we share something in common. Yes, thank you. Perfect. So um, it is necessary concept as they imply. And uh, the main thing is that this is something that is practical. So people are involved in the process of transformation, of coexistence, active coexistence with each other, cooperation and learning, social, social learning. But they also claim that, and this produced a multitude of those people, new kind of people, <laughs> post-revolutionary people. And, uh, but also according to them, political concept of love, so this social love, it already always existed. And uh, love is everything like this. Love is people coexist uh, with, with each other. So it's not only the, something uh, that describes the future, this better future, but it also describes describe the present reality and it describes the, the past. And what, why I like the con this concept is because uh, is because it's realistic since they claim that violence is a necessary part of, of love. So it means it is realistic in a way that it includes violence. It doesn't say that um, violence is opposite of love and we need to get rid of it, of violence, not of love and uh, everything is going to be perfect. So they do realize that love comes with the with violence, that that's the other side of, of love, that love is violent. And uh, the other thing that they claim is that uh, some types of love uh, is not some types of uh, political phenomena are not uh, opposite to love because it's still people, cooperation. And, um, but we can call, or they can call them, they do call them the love gone bad, the corrupted love. And examples are fascism, fundamentalism, terrorism, capitalist exploitation, nation, family. So we did discuss some of them. Family is the first example because it reduces the scope of love to a certain people. It's normally uh, heterosexual Na nation is same. But today we're going to discuss fascism more. <laughs> this after the break. <laughs> um, so and I'll try to show, try to prove the idea that it's still love, but it's a corrupted type of love. So it's not completely opposite to uh, the problem. Is it's the big problem, the biggest maybe that it's not the opposite to this idealized even in Negri and Hart version type of love, but it's uh, still cooperation, it still involves, it is still practice of, of, uh, of love, just it's the love gone bad. So why Negri and Hart think that it's important to, to analyze, to, um, to describe love as fascism, as love, as love gone bad, as corrupted type of love? Because so that we can be more realistic about this social structures and also that we can find um, a way to say when love goes bad, when love starts to be corrupted. So the problem is how to tell uh, when love starts to be corrupted. And the big 
problem is another problem that is very hard to say uh, from the inside of a certain uh, social order, even um, if you're not inside a uh, certain social order, it's very hard to say to analyze. It comes uh, maybe later in history and this analysis of, of social cooperation that claims that it's something wrong with it, but not within the order, within this cooperation itself. And Negri and Hart are more optimistic here. They claim they developed, uh, maybe you read it. They do develop um, some ideas how to, how to say that love uh, is corrupted, but I wouldn't be that realistic. I think it's much harder to, it's much harder to, uh, to say, uh, it's much harder to find those guarantees that love haven't, haven't gone bad but we'll still try to, to do it. And the reading for this week that you had is uh, Paul Bloom. Mm, hopefully we'll have time with the presentations to discuss it uh, during the seminars. It's a it's recent book and it's very controversial and it's well known, people are talking about it. So it's, it's good to know the, context, the content of this book. So his basic idea is that empathy is biased. He's writing, he, the book is controversial because um, Bloom started to doubt something that people um, almost never, I think, doubt that something wrong with the empathy, that empathy is not guarantee that uh, people um, will live happily together, that uh, love won't be love. He doesn't use the, uh, Negri and Hart term, but it's in our terms that love won't go on, won't go bad. That lo love is not corrupted type of love. So if anyone already known uh, familiar with Paul Bloom idea, can you summarize it? Flat? <laughs> what? Yes, he basically claims that uh, empathy can lead to the unpredictably bad uh, results if uh, we emphasize not emphasize if we feel empathy uh, towards certain people and uh, do not feel the same towards other people or other creatures or uh, we can uh, make some decisions based on this irrational empathy as uh, with example with a dying girl who needs uh, uh, a medicine but other children gets medi medicine too but then people are asked uh, uh, can you can you feel what this girl feels and they make this decision uh, not in favor of other kids and so on and uh, instead of empathy he suggests compassion as uh, something mixed uh, between this irrational empathy and some rational uh, moral um, understandings of the situation and Basically, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Any more ideas or comments? What Bloom? Uh, what Bloom's idea is, and how is it controversial? <clears throat> if if you're raising your hand, I can't see it. You can just start talking. Okay, I don't <laughs> start talking. Yeah. So this is basically his idea uh, developed in a couple of chapters that uh, empathy is biased that we um, even if we like someone uh, we feel this emotion maybe social love uh, understood as emotion it's not a guarantee that society will function well because uh, because empathy is biased because we tend to like people who are more alike us and who are for example cute and not those who actually need help and the other problem is that we tend to and this also means that for example it uh, sounds familiar for us uh, if you remember the uh, negri and hard idea that uh, the violence is other side of love because for example if we like people who are more like us uh, a certain group of people like the nation uh, Russians, for example, if we are from Russia, or 
Mm. So the, the idea of nationalism will start to prefer think that those people are better and defend them from from other group of people who are not like us. So this uh, the defense the protection uh, also might come with the violence. And we know that uh, normally the justification of uh, war, it becomes as a protection from someone. So the idea is that we protect someone who is uh, dangerous for us. It's, it's also made in the name of made in the name of love, right? Some violent acts. It's presented as a protection because of the empathy, because of this attachment that is bias, and the the basic idea maybe was if you remember we were talking about oxytocin, link with Krishna and in my part too, that. Uh, even if oxytocin is something that is responsible for mother, the basic mother-child, uh, mother-infant attachment and the attachment between people, it also it's not a, it's not a remedy for just to give people more oxytocin. Since there is this other side, uh, even in animals, in uh, I think in goats or sheep, uh, that if they introduce uh, it comes with the aggression of protection of your own child. And with humans, we know that uh, you like your child, but you're going to be uh, going to violently protect your child uh, if, uh, for example, from other children. So you are uh, aggressive towards the love to your child makes you unfortunately aggressive, might make you more aggressive to, uh, to other children. If it's pure oxytocin, like in sheep, it makes uh, or goats. Uh, it makes them more aggressive towards the the children, the babies from the other mothers' ships. <laughs> so that's it is problematic. It, it's it's not easy to find a way out. It's just uh, the it's not it's not a way out just to add more love and to clean it from the violence because the violence comes weirdly uh, love comes with the violence as its uh, dark side, as with empathy. And Bloom also claims uh, that people normally think that, for example, uh, fascism, uh, if uh, fascists would be, th that the common idea is, is, is that if fascists would be more empathic, uh, the, what happened uh, wouldn't happen, right? So the common idea is that we just need to add this empathy we need to add kind of develop this uh, common love and everything is going to be great so Paul Bloom tries to prove that it's not a solution well his solution that it has to be rational it's also not a perfect solution because rational uh, also can be biased right rational is not the opposite to uh, to emotional uh, we can't thinking is emotional thinking and this is based on we can rationalize the humans are very clever they can rationalize anything any any emotions and present them as uh, as rational and not emotional unfortunately so it it sounds like a solution and we want to believe it because we really like to <laughs> really like solutions, sex, uh, especially easy ones. But it's it's not that easy. So uh, he claims that it's not right that if we'll add some empathy to fascists, uh, they'll start being uh, evil. It's not true, unfortunately. And I'll try to show that it's even worse. So it's not the problem with fascists that they did lack uh, empathy. Of humanity, some human feelings. They did, uh, did surprisingly, maybe they did uh, have human feelings, and maybe in certain aspects even more than uh, some of us, <laughs> and than maybe me. So uh, the problem with fascism is maybe you're familiar with Godwin's law. Do you know what's Godwin's law? Well, it's written here. <laughs> So the Godwin's law uh, was elaborated, I think, in 1990 or 1991, but it, it was checked uh, later and it, it works. Uh, it claims Godwin came up with this law, uh, with this principle, uh, when he was observing online discussions 
And he claimed uh, as early as 1990s that uh, as online discussion grows, as people talk to each other more and more in, uh, on the internet, the probability of uh, comparison involving Nazis or Hitler approaches one, so almost 100%. The more we talk on the internet, it also works now. The more chances, so human communication, online at least communication, um, ends up in comparing someone to a Hitler or to a Nazi. It's kind of our universal feature, uh, probably. So it's it is about in online discussions, but um, but it's just online discussion that it's easy to uh, to study, right? We can't study real human discussion, but there are reasons to believe that it's the uh, same in uh, actually in offline discussions too, that this end up human us comparing to, to each other. And one of the possible explanations of why is this happening? So when we call someone Hitler or Nazi, we, mm, Nazism and fascism, I'm using them as synonyms here, uh, they are, they function as the, as a symbol of the biggest evil, right? Of the biggest embodiment. It's even worse to call someone fascist is even worse than call someone pure evil because evil is kind of abstract, right? It's just, it's even nice when someone calls you pure evil because it's an abstract and global phenomenon. But if someone call you fascism, we have, all, we have the whole, um, whole historical um, experience terrible historical experience attached to this, right? So you, uh, it's actually evil that is embodied. And it actually, this is the way to, first of all, to hurt people, uh, to devaluate them and to dehumanize them, right? So discussion, the argument, go, discussion and the argument that uh, develops from the discussion, it ends up into devaluating others and uh, devaluate and why we do that. Uh, because uh, devaluation, dehumanization, when we present them as non-human, means the license that we can license for us, well, not to destroy, but to, to hurt them, to commit this violence. So the problem is in that in very, we now use fascism in the opposite way. We tend to use fascism in the opposite way as we, uh, as we think we do. We use it in the same way that fascists did use it with... Uh, with uh, Jewish people by dehumanizing them and making uh, making it the reason to to destroy them, and with this fascism kind of turned into it's uh, it's not the only way we're doing it, but it's like the the obvious way, and we are doing it in the name of something good, right? In the name of uh, destroying uh, fascism, actually. So this is how tricky it is. This is how tricky the social law and taking care of humanity. That is something that is presented as taking care of humanity, right? We don't want obviously uh, fascist, and, um, fascism, the experience of uh, historical experience to uh, repeat again in history, but uh, in the very act of fighting it, we kind of weirdly uh, re repeat same thing that, not the same, but a similar thing that fascists did. So um, the God Godwin's law works still today uh, and uh, not sure it only works online, but now <laughs> I think we can exist only online. So um, in the online, uh, online version of humanity, it's still violent and still this love comes with the violence. And the, the worst thing that it, our attempts to get rid of of violence comes with the violence. And the same, by the way, we can present, I will show you with, uh, with real uh, Nazi experience. <clears throat> For example, today, of course, we know that we can't kill others, that it's very bad, we value human lives and uh, what happened in Nazi Germany is terrible, but uh, the only person, uh, the only person we think is good to kill is Hitler, right? We can, we make uh, jokes about it. For example, the, the the recent joke is that Hitler is a good person that because he killed Hitler, Hitler committed suicide. So <laughs> it's very uh, ambiguous here. 
and from from uh, since we are children we know that the hitler is the one who is good to kill right who we have license to kill because he's a terrible person and this, this is why we call other people who we don't like uh, we call them uh, fascist or hitler because they are obviously bad but this is how we justify ourselves that uh, by dehumanizing them that we can destroy them so we're not supposed to if someone is hitler we not we can kill them and destroy them don't treat them uh, we shouldn't love them anymore and this is the advertisement i wanted to show you it's, about, it's funny it's about hitler and that it's a good thing to kill hitler so it's uh, it's like opposite of the social advertising was still social advertising Tell me if you can hear it. An accident. Every driver's worst nightmare. But what if you could take it back? Going 65 miles per hour, it takes 365 feet to bring your car to a complete stop. Driving just five miles per hour slower, you gain an additional 100 feet of stopping space. So what would you rather say? 30 seconds or a life? Oh my God. So the uh, example here is that it's actually the only person is good to kill is Hitler, right? But not all people are Hitler. That's why just in case we shouldn't kill, mm, <clears throat> shouldn't drive recklessly and shouldn't maybe kill people because we, we, <laughs> we probably won't be that lucky. Never know. But it is a cultural, um, something not obvious for us, maybe uh, in our culture that there is this um uh, we should we be not allowed to kill people it's something that our moral norm is that we should value each person's life but at the same time uh, maybe unconsciously uh, no one says that uh, out loud that except hitler is exception we should kill them but it kind of goes without saying in the culture in, in society so something we don't even notice and the problem is that the terrible things come as unnoticeable, as uh, un not articulated, as this, uh, and they exist as a contradiction with the general norm. So we still, in this way, we still feel ourselves good, that we uh, we know that it's bad to kill, but uh, there is this unsaid. Maybe sometimes uh, we uh, we do say it. Um, some certain exceptions from this norm. So let's discuss the humanity of Hitler. And what I'm saying here, I'm going to develop here. It's not I'm trying. It's not that I'm trying to, even if it might look like that. I'm not trying to justify any of that. I mean, uh, I hope we recognize how terrible it was, and there's no way to justify it, no way to present it as something good. I'm just showing the, the this problematicity of love that it's not the opposite of love, that uh, love is very dangerous, that there is no, uh, like Bloom uh, claims, there is no mm, simple way out that we need to get rid of kind of love as a feeling and develop some rational uh, rational strategy. It won't work. It will, it will still be love, just rationalized love, and maybe with um, more danger to uh, with this rationalization because it's presented as objective as uh, non-biased to do some some mistakes so i'm not trying to justify anything i'm just trying to um, present it with both sides uh, hoping that we remember the terrible sides even though i'll show you the the opposite side so we know fascist fashion for us is the something um, in our memory 
something that is opposite to our imagination, maybe of a perfect love of the future, this post-revolutionary soul love of a multitude. Um, but um, and we, it, it's easier to think that fascism was like a collection of non-empathic bad people who didn't something that was the, the embodiment of the opposite of law. Well, it wasn't, and from within, it looks uh, didn't look that terrible, and it didn't look as opposite of of love and of compassion. So let's start with Hitler, who we have want to kill. Uh, and because he's uh, he, this is a good example because he's embodiment of for us uh, embodiment of this um, non-human right of something who is opposite to, to human. That's why we call people fascists when we don't like them. But we'll talk about the humanity of Hitler. The interesting thing about Hitler is that uh, when he was young and his mother was dying from breast cancer. His sister, Paula Hitler, claims that, uh, testifies that uh, her brother, so Hitler, was um, very uh, caring, uh, extremely caring, unlike other children, his siblings, and he was the one who was taking care of his, uh, his dying mother and demonstrating the great love for her. Also, uh, the doctor, the family doctor, who was Jewish, by the way, uh, was uh, surprised how caring Hitler was, so how was uh, with interaction with him, uh, how he was helping to get, take care of, of his mother and uh, Hitler and uh, Bloch, uh, they remained uh, friends. They were talking to each other, even though he was Jewish. Uh, even when, uh, when uh, Hitler became the, uh, Whatever in when when he was when he was growing up, and also we know about other features of Hitler, and I know that you can see uh, we can find many pictures of him with animals, especially dogs, and with children. You know that Stalin. There are lots of pictures of Stalin with children and Lenin with with children. So all people who are questionable. Uh, sometimes are presented as the pure evil. We all have those pictures and it's not, unfortunately, as Hitler especially, unfortunately, it's not uh, so easy that they were just in terms of propaganda pretending that they are kind and nice to children, animals and people in general. But there is there are reasons to think that they were actually uh, nice. And if uh, Mahatma Gandhi is correct, and uh, we should evaluate uh, the greatness of nations by how the nation treat animals, then we should claim that uh, Nazi Germany was actually the, the, best, the best nation ever, even though we know it from the other side that it was the worst uh, nation ever. So uh, not only Hitler uh, sincerely liked animals and he was a vegetarian, and he was defending animal rights, but the whole Nazi Germany was very progressive in, in this way. So Nazi Germany, uh, first of all, they do believe they create one of the reasons they criticize Christianity is because it's uh, because of the culture of meat eating. And that causes uh, suffering uh, to animals and uh, therefore Nazis saw uh, Christianity as morally degraded because of this and also um, uh, nazi germany leaders they also like claim to like uh, animal for example the uh, race fuller ss himmler he um, he wrote the uh, story fairy tales for children about mice mouses mice someone who find the mice in their house and instead of killing the mice they took uh, them to the or one mouse no no the mice <laughs> a couple of them they took them to a court and uh, and treat them as equals to to humans instead of just killing them so uh, this is to what extent the, the the nazi german the nazi leaders who were uh, killing uh, many people 
So they do treat mice as uh, as uh, equal to to humans. And um, also in 1933, uh, the Raystar uh, banned a vivisection. And we still don't have it in in many countries. And uh, also the uh, the ban on hunting, this hunting was restricted. This also didn't reach that level. And uh, the process that will uh, eliminate slaughterhouses after, uh, after he will win. And we still do have slaughterhouses uh, in, in Europe. So this is the picture, the poster where animals, uh, I think it was uh, after the banned vivisection, the animals are saluting uh, Nazi leader. And Göring, he was one, one of the main leaders in Third Reich. Uh, he claimed that those who still uh, think they can continue to treat animals as inanimate property would be sent to concentration camps. So they did justify this uh, sending people to concentration camps as uh, uh, by their inhumanity, that you, they're not human enough, therefore they need to be punished. And there's this movie that I don't recommend you to watch, and it's by the I was trying to s watch it in Russia, and it's banned as a Nazi propaganda, which it is, but it's still a, a historical movie. So um, in 1930, mm. this Nazi film was uh, was presented and it was presented as a documentary and it's obviously a pr propaganda film. The, and one of the main scenes against the Jewish, uh, the one, one of the main scenes is the slaughtering, the Jewish uh, ritual of slaughtering of a cow. So they do show the cow that is uh, dying in convulsion and uh, with blood. And they do present it as a, as a demonstration of how inhuman uh, Jewish people are because they have this this customs right so and the message the key message of the movie that uh, because of that because of not only because of the uh, because they kill animals and don't respect animals right but for other reasons the main message that uh, that Jewish people are inhuman Jewish culture is the opposite to being human and therefore we should prevent, they should prevent uh, Jewish uh, blood to poisoning, Jewish blood poisoning of German blood. So surprisingly, their propaganda is based on the idea that same as we do it now, at uh, calling someone fascist, uh, making them, turning them, uh, giving them this inhuman properties. So we get the license to destroy them, not to treat them as humans as equal to us. And uh, same, uh, same fascists did with, uh, with uh, Jewish people, presenting them as non-human and therefore that's someone who uh, needs to be eliminated for the better of humanity in the name of uh, maybe empathy, uh, maybe love to, but to, to German people, to those human people who need to be protected from inhuman people. Also, in the history of development of fascists, so they are directly directly stated that fascism is love. And uh, Giuseppe Mazzini, he's not fascist thinker, but so it's in Italy, Italian, not German one, not Nazism, but fascism. And um, Giuseppe Mazzini is not fascist, but proto-fascist, so the one who uh, have thinkers that were before and based the uh, created the fundament. Uh, the base for um, for later uh, fascist uh, theories. So he claimed directly he uh, acknowledged that religion, uh, the religion of humanity, is love. The same exactly thing like Na Negri and Hart claims, right? But somehow uh, this is the the love done was was mistaken. It uh, turned into what it turned. But it's uh, we're still doing the same mistake. But we, I'm not sure it's possible not to make mistake with love. 
and that uh, thinking that it's enough just to uh, and to have this empathy to have a pure feeling uh, and defend humanity and just love our neighbors love others and this will guarantee something so we we do have all the guarantees and we do feel that way <laughs> the same way <clears throat> we have our willingness to protect humanity from those who are inhuman but by doing this um, by this articulating these guarantees we actually articulate the same things <clears throat> that fascists were articulating and it's very hard to to find actual guarantees considering this and uh, Benedetto Croce claimed that heart of fascism is love to, of Italy. And of course, we can claim here that it's easy to figure out what's the problem with this love, because this love is the <clears throat> love to a certain country, right? So it's uh, corrupted because it's reduced to a nation, it's reduced to a country. But if we think about love to all humans it's still reduced to humanity and this gives us license to kill humans who are inhuman to cows for example who kill cows and lots of us eat meat and there's lots of us in danger in in this case so it's uh, it's not even guarantee if we talk about all people and the other thing is that we, if we talk about in the name of all, love to all people this is a license to kill those who don't like all people right be, we will call them fascist and uh, because they don't like some people and this is how we'll justify some evil uh, acts against them and also it's very similar to Foucault I mean we can use Foucault biopolitics to analyze uh, obviously Foucault doesn't talk much about fashion only a couple of times he's mentioning but uh, he, if you if one will elaborate his claim is that the whole biopolitics or something that we uh, can say is the most progressive in our society that's the public health system uh, the indication maybe of a social progress that we take care of human bodies we take care we have this whole structure developed uh, especially during pandemics we pay extra attention to the health system right and we rely on it a lot uh, even more to some political structures so it start to be something that dominates and we do perceive it we have to perceive it as a as something good because we need someone to rely to instead of just no one to rely to but the, the danger comes the dangerous part of it that uh, nazi germany eugenics is uh, basically very similar it has a very similar idea of just healthy bodies, mm -hmm. healthy blood, <clears throat> the purity of blood, and uh, to ensure the tri uh, triumph of the race. So our idea of healthy body and those who um, would claim, especially concerning psychological health, right? Uh, the psychiatry uh, is getting better, it's getting maybe less repressive, but it was Mm -hmm. Many times the instance of uh, instance who uh, defines who has uh, a right to function equally in society who don't have an right to function equally in life, who has supposed to be treated, how they're supposed to be treated, uh, if uh, people uh, have to be secluded. So uh, in the name of good, in the name of health, mm -hmm. is, Lots of uh, terrible things uh, might be done. And we never know because we actually, they do actually help people, right? It's not that they're pure evil. We, the, the other, it's the other side of them helping people and making them better and uh, taking care of, of people who need to take care of and not only those, those who need to take care of. So that's the, the trick. It, it is actual care. It's not, it's not pure evil. And if same as with love, we get rid of love, if we get rid of this embodiment of a public health system, uh, this embodiment of social societal care, uh, we'll just eliminate everything, right? It's uh, we won't, uh, if you have the idea that uh, some pure uh, social way of social care will remain and pure love will remain it's not true because those are the other side of the love so love is everything we have and there is no hope for 
nothing will work without it, right? But it always comes with this with this dark side that we to survive and to uh, be happy. We need to we need not to see, just to to ignore that this part exists. And um, Hitler, in his will, uh, in his final will, claimed. Uh, so something that he wanted to remain after his death, the message that he wanted to remain after his death is that um, the, to, the people have to, Germans have to resist uh, the, the poisoner of all nations, international jewelry. So uh, they saw Jewish people as basically a poison in, the, in terms of health. They saw it as uh, them as uh, someone who uh, poisoning the blood as a disease that need to be that uh, social body need to be healed from and so it was justified in the name of health in the name of a better human more human society less morally degraded society and uh, so after world war ii there were some actually many uh, social conformity studies to um, people, researchers who are trying to understand why this happened, uh, why the subordination to Nazi leaders, why people actually, because it was massive pro pro process and it involved lots of people uh, in um, lots of people killing uh, other people. So, uh, there, there's supposed to be a process of obeying, right? And the question was why people obey um, others? Why can't they sing for, for themselves? And why do they, uh, why do they follow um, the orders to kill? So one of the first, maybe you remember it because I was introducing it with those of you who were taking the writing and thinking seminar with me. Uh, Ash conformity experiment is very similar to the one uh, Andre likes to talk about the pyramids, uh, black and white pyramids. Do you remember one of them? Either Ash test or the pyramids, Andre Cherbinok, I mean. Uh, yes, in his greeting speech, he example made an example. Yes, so. Uh, I think uh, Andre is too hopeful here because he, <laughs> for him, and well, Ash test as well, both Sherbinok and Ash. <laughs> um, so they do, they do hope. And here it's hard, it's easy to say with the with the sticks, and with the pyramids too that there is a white pyramid and people uh, keep if other people claim that uh, pyramid is the white pyramid is black or the opposite. Uh, we start to we start to some people start to say that it, it is black even though it's white, but uh, with the color and with the length of sticks, it's easier to say. But with other stuff, it's not that easy. So, uh, does anyone remember what's Ash experiment? Uh, how it goes with, with sticks? Oh, good, I will tell you. <laughs> so Ash conducted the experiment and during the first stage of experiment for his first card was once the card away, I think, and they presented the second card and they asked to find the uh, on the first card. My connection is in stay. Uh, they asked people to find the uh, stick, which is the same uh, same length on a on a second card. And initially, all the people, uh, all the answers were correct. So uh, they said that it's the last stick. They coined it uh, in the size. But uh, on the next stage of experiment, uh, the next stage was that uh, first, uh, before uh, before the person will answer the question which stick they were presented they were exposed to wrong answers of actors who claim that for example stick a is uh, is the correct answer that it's the same size as the, as the stick on the initial card and after hearing the strong answers from people who played their roles 75% uh, of participants actually obeyed this uh, wrong opinion of, of majority and they repeated the false answer so they actually 
obeyed the wrong uh, the wrong opinion of uh, majority. But the most interesting um, the most interesting I think experiment was done later. It was done using fMRI. It's similar to ASH test, but it's uh, it was not about sticks anymore. It was about the three D figures. They have to in uh, fMRI thing. They have to rotate those figures, three uh, D figures, and say if they are same. And um, initially, again, it's uh, if they if uh, those uh, ex who experiment was conducted upon if they were not presented others answers they did give correct answers initially but if they were after they were presented the wrong answers uh, they actually claimed they gave a wrong answer and why this fmri study is interested because it turned out that um, people actually do believe they didn't know Lie, right? They did believe they actually saw those figures as same after they were presented this wrong, uh, wrong eyes answer by majority by other people. They didn't make it up to, to fit. They actually see uh, it changed their perspective, their perception. They actually saw those figures as same figures. And this is a question if we can have independent thinking. Right. If we don't even know what we see, it's not that we we see something correctly and then we um, mm -hmm. and then we just lie to fit, uh, not to look weird. We don't do it. We, we might actually those people, probably most of them, uh, they actually saw, uh, and probably in Ash test too, they actually saw those uh, sticks as the uh, same late sticks. So it's unconscious on an unconscious level. We can't say, mm, yeah, we can't consciously distinguish it. And this is the part of the social learning. And maybe in Shirbinoka example, those children, especially children, if you talk about children, they, they probably started to see, uh, not that black is white, but uh, we also learned from whoever we learned from, from parents uh, that a word right, white designates a certain something, <laughs> right? And now if a teacher is telling us and if other people are telling us who are authority for us that you should call this black instead of white, we just believe them in the same way like we believed our parents who initially taught us that this is black. So it's not, uh, and we start to see it black, we have the, um, we have this connotation that the word black coincide with this, this reality that we see. So this, it's not the obedience that much, it's just a normal process of social learning. And it's very hard, like Shebinox thinks, to, uh, to just think independently and to say the true colors, right? Because those true colors were introduced by us uh, just early, earlier in life by, uh, by our parents or someone else. And we don't know if they are correct and what is it even mm, correct in, in this uh, in this understanding. So it's it's much harder than this. It's and same with the social love and social practices, uh, with obedience to others. We just don't know, right? Uh, what is imposed on us and what is if it's bad thing. We should think independently if it's better, but we just don't know. It's much deeper and it's much less, uh, it's not conscious for us, not always conscious. It's very hard to uh, to figure out uh, the right answers and to um, come up with our own independent thinking. Not sure. It's thinking is always social in, in this way. And we even never know um, if it's uh, our, <laughs> where is it our thinking? What is our thinking? So this way, it's it's very hard. Um, and this is you read Hannah Arendt. Not sure any one of you is familiar with the banality of evil, but we all read her work on freedom and political freedom during uh, writing and thinking. So and in her book, Hannah Arendt. Uh, was analyzing the case of adult Eichmann and she was, since it's called the banality of evil, so 
uh, she was trying to answer the question. Mm. There is Adolf Eichmann. Adolf Eichmann is the one who is directly responsible for uh, for Holocaust, uh, one of the Nazi uh, leaders. And she was, uh, Hannah Arendt was present on uh, Adolf Eichmann trial. And uh, as a result of uh, analyzing this trial, she, she published this book. So uh, Eichmann uh, approximately uh, is involved in, not approximately involved, but involved in killing approximately six, six million Jews, but we don't know for sure. So it's uh, well off. Mm. And <clears throat> the desperate hope of Hannah Arendt, I think, mm, is to find what is wrong, to observe Eichmann and to find during the trial and to find what is wrong with him. And she, she keeps this hope, uh, I think I see it that way, that she keeps this hope uh, during all uh, the process of, of writing her book, that she's trying to find what is wrong with, with, with Eichmann. Maybe he's too trustful, maybe he's overly reliant, maybe he's incapable of independent thinking. We still have this hope that we can have critical independent thinking and we're gonna be great. <laughs> Uh, so she she keeps this hope uh, to find what is the what is the point of this monstrosity? How is he how is he different from other people? Because other people don't kill six million Jews, right? There's supposed to be something that will distinguish uh, Eichmann from other features of humanity. What, what to tell people, <laughs> not that to, to be together with other people, all the like other hopes. So what is this mental deviation with those people? We can do that. How we can be, because it's obviously, it's obvious mental disorder, normal human calculus can kill others. But the problem is Yeah, nice. Where is Julie? I believe she has internet connection problems. Arseny, you are an organizer now. Uh, yeah. Can you really? continue? With the Please continue, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, since I'm or an organizer, I say that the lecture is finished, you can go now. Yeah, you're free to go. I'm here, here again. Welcome back. Hi. <laughs> you missed me. Good. So good I'm back because you would never find out what will happen next. That there is no hope actually. Um okay, so here's a one again for you. <clears throat> so the thing is that aren't never actually found this hope because uh, as she testifies and those uh, psychiatrists, psychologists who were present on the trial, um, they claim that they never found uh, anything that deviates from normal in him, so that his psychological outlook is completely fine and his attitude towards his wife and children and mother and father is not normal, but most desirable. So he was a good person. We might claim, of course, that uh, same as was Hitler, who was extraordinary in comparison with his even brothers and sister, extraordinary good with his mother, that um, he uh, kind of, that might be the problem because we uh, feel this blooms empathy for those who are like us, to those who are akin to us. And maybe when, with Hitler, it was same with his uh, taking care of Germany and like uh, given such a great sacrifice his his life and his actions to to germany 
which is might be the involved of his mother, just on a larger scale. But uh, I'm not sure that the opposite works, right? That those people who don't like their family and their nation and uh, uh, other reduced version don't hear a reduced version of this, they are, they are good or they are at least not dangerous because they're even worse, they might be even worse, right? So that's the problem that you can't tell that uh, not uh, today psychologists, we have some maybe hypothesis, but there's no 100% to say when. And the other problem is that Eichmann, uh, as many of us, maybe all of us, uh, would still just remain a great, this great person who likes his, um, who was faithful, who is great brother and uh, husband. Uh, he would remain this person if the, um, if event won't, events won't just turn this way as they turned, then we will never find out, right? They'll just never, he would never find out this about himself. And he still, to the end, he believed that he's, he was claiming that he's a good person deep inside, even if what he did maybe was wrong. But uh, deep inside, he doesn't feel that he's a terrible person. He's, he, he believed actually that after what he did, that he's a good person, not some badass. Um, and uh, nonetheless, um, mm, well, not nonetheless, but obviously the, he was uh, ended, the trial was ended with a verdict of a death penalty. And uh, the way they capture Eichmann didn't, uh, was, was not perfectly human. And the way they treated him wasn't uh, after they captured him, uh, Israeli police uh, secret service wasn't uh, human uh, and uh, didn't uh, didn't follow the um, the normal human <laughs> procedure and also uh, so the the other problem is this death uh, penalty uh, they killed Eichmann and they did kill Eichmann by just following the laws by following the rules so they did the same to him to punish him as he did to Jewish because the, he also did follow the the laws he followed the instructions and we're still doing it we're still doing it in the and um, I'm not claiming there is wrong well death penalty is uh, uh, I think it's wrong personally but we st still uh, they still have prisons and I'm not sure it's possible to organize society uh, without prisons. So we, so we're still doing it, but we still justify. We don't see it as a similar. We see it as a something, something opposite to uh, to Nazi Germany, hoping that it is opposite. So after, mm, I tell you about Milgram experiment. After the, <clears throat> after Hannah uh, Arendt wrote her book, after people start to wonder. Uh, father wondering uh, what is wrong with those people how to define how to see uh, how to see the uh, where it goes where this social law uh, starts to go uh, bad uh, Milgram conducted experiment and uh, all of you maybe not all of you know about Milgram experiment but all of you uh, remember Zimbardo prison it was done experiment that you are familiar from uh, writing and thinking. Uh, Zimbardo experiment uh, was conducted later after Milgram and Zimbardo's main inspiration maybe was uh, that he was completing, competing with Milgram. So they were un both trying to answer the same question. Why, um, how is this, <clears throat> how is this happening? <clears throat> or why is this happening? Why do why do people obey? Why people are turning into uh, into inhuman creatures? Stanley Milgram claims that uh, his question he was trying to answer that could it be that Eichmann and his millions accomplices in the Holocaust were just following orders? And uh, yeah, I'll show you a video about the Milgram experiment. Okay. It's two minutes. A decade earlier, 
Psychologist Stanley Milgram had also looked at how we respond to authority. In order to understand how people were induced to obey unjust regimes and participate in atrocities such as the Holocaust, he set up an experiment. Volunteers were told they were taking part in scientific research to improve memory. Will you open those and tell me which of you is which, please? Separated by a screen, the teacher would ask the learner questions in a word game and administer an electric shock when the answer was incorrect. He was told to increase the voltage with each wrong answer. Cloud, horse, rock, house. Answer, wrong. 150 volts. Answer, horse. <laughs> Experiment. That's all. Get me out of here. Get me out of here, please. Continue, please. Go right on. The experiment requires you continue, teacher. Please continue. Participants didn't know that the learner was really an actor, and the so-called shocks harmless. You're gonna get a shock. 180 volts. I can't stand the pain. Let me out of here. Stand it. I'm not gonna kill that man. I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one. Slow. Walk, dance, truck, music. Two-thirds of volunteers were prepared to administer a potentially fatal electric shock when encouraged to do so by what they perceived as a legitimate authority figure. In this case, a man in a white coat. 375 volts. I think something's happened to that fall in there. Milgram's findings horrified America. They showed that decent American citizens were as capable of committing acts against their conscience as the Germans had been under the Nazis. Great. So. Uh... Milgram experiment, as you see from the video, this was the video of the actually original initial Milgram experiment it was replicated many times. And um, so uh, during the experiment, uh, experiment was announced to take, uh, uh, to invite, experiment invited people to take, uh, take a part in the experiment about learning as, uh, inventing the new types of learning and uh, the participants of experiment uh, those who were experiment up conducted upon were um, were playing the role of the teachers and the idea was that they have to uh, give electric shock to a student uh, who is uh, making a mistake and with with each mistake to see presumably to see if this uh, improves the process of learning. So it was not a real electric shock and they didn't see those um, uh, those students. The students were in a different room, but they could hear the uh, actors, the sounds actors were playing, the sounds of pain um, once they were, were, when, they, when they were given those electric shocks. And that there was a figure of Milgram himself wearing a white robe that, uh, uh, as you saw in the video, when uh, participants of experiment started to doubt if they should uh, level up the voltage, uh, Milgram would come and say, or someone else in the white robe will come and say that they take uh, full responsibility for them, for this, and that they have to do it. Um, therefore, just uh, pre representing this authority that they could rely on. And uh, most of the people um, actually, I think two uh, thirds of the people, probably most of them, uh, at least uh, most of them obeyed and some of them uh, um, leveled up the voltage uh, to the 450 volts. And this is the deadly level. So they basically killed uh, they didn't actually kill it because it was pretend fun, but this uh, this level of voltage uh, kills people. So they basically uh, killed people uh, 
by just following the authority and relying on authority. So Milgram was trying to understand the uh, similar situation like in Nazi Germany. In Nazi Germany, when people were obeying orders that led to uh, elimination, uh, mass elimination, uh, active elimination of, of people. And uh, yeah, 65% of, of those teachers, they actually went to highest level of 400 volts, so basically to a level that kills, uh, kills students. Of course, here, um, the authority was, was science, right? It was a uni presented as a university experiment. And we still do rely on science. We do rely on education. That's why you, that's why you're here, and you trust me and Krishna. <laughs> Whatever we're telling you, we well, <clears throat> we don't try. We don't trust that much. Uh, well, maybe not to that extent after the Second World War. To uh, political um, bodies and to politics, we see it as a bit more evil than I think. People saw it before, but we still do rely on uh, on science. And maybe after Milgram experiment, we won't we won't rely on science because whatever we start to over rely on, it's, it's quite dangerous. Mm. So, so, what what else? What is important here for us is not it's. Uh, I don't think it's it's a correct thing to present it as obedience. Ex those experiment uh, as a and the problem is that people rely on authority and obey authorities. I don't think it's the even correct formulation of what Milgram experiment uh, revealed. The other experiment, the additional more additional, well, it's still Milgram. Mm. So yeah, his conclusion, his basic conclusion is disillusionment and he claimed that yes, people still rely after all the uh, all that humanity went through we still do rely on uh, authorities therefore we're still ready to kill just because uh, just because uh, we rely on authority and he proved that hannah Arendt concept that the evil is just banal it's no way to distinguish it from the good it's no it doesn't have any particular feature in it that distinguishes it obviously from the from uh, from the good and that we didn't change that much uh, that is at that time well in in our time too we are, we are not that much different from nazis uh, even though we don't want to be uh, we do uh, we do see how terrible it was what happened and but we still we still the same that this can still happen and uh, milgram hope initially was that it was something wrong with German people, right? It's there this for this reason he wanted to conduct this experiment in America and in Germany, hoping that in America people are uh, more, you know, kinder and they want uh, more freedom loving and they won't obey orders and destroy other people. Germany, they're more obeying, but it turned out it's more or less the same in all countries. It's the only difference is that women might be uh, might perform better on it, so might not uh, the percentage of women who went to those the level of 150 vol uh, volts is less than men, but in in terms of countries it's same and it's still same. It was it now it's uh, forbidden to uh, replicate the Milgram experiment as in human, but uh, it was done. I think in 2014 in Poland, the last one that is known uh, to us, publicly known, and the result is still same. So six years ago, it was humanity <laughs> didn't change. Um, yeah, and this this is the important uh, additional research. So um, Haslam um, published this paper in 2014. And what he was doing, he he did a research on uh, he did a research on evaluation uh, evaluation of uh, how people reported. So after people participated in this experiment, they had to write the post experimental reports and submit them. How uh, this is the additional research on how 
why, why people did it, their justification, how did they feel about the experiment. Mm. Even though they found out later that um, the, the goal of experiment was not to study this new innovative types of learning, but the, they were the object of experiment. If they would kill, if they would destroy people or, uh, by, by just obeying the order. So interestingly, well, standing Milgram himself writes that he observed uh, uh, this um, stressed man, man who is stressed. Uh, they deal some of the feel stressed and nervous and collapsed because they had to do it. And we saw in the video that uh, uh, the person doesn't want to obey the or orders that they question because they, it's uh, stressful to hurt other person, well, naturally uh, stressful. But uh, according to this report, and it, 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 the, the general atmosphere, emotional atmosphere was actually happy and people didn't regret participating in that. But on the contrary, the main feeling that they had is that um, they did something important and they were happy to participate in socially uh, in, in something, something important, something that is useful for science and for society. So this is one of the uh, participants uh, evaluation of uh, how they felt during the experiments. He claims that he was delighted to participate in a project uh, that he was often thinking about the subject and that he was happy uh, and happy to be the part of it, happy uh, to, to, to to give his efforts and to cooperate and to be useful. Yeah, so the, the conclusion that Haslam made is that it is this uh, self same identification with a noble cause that led participants to prove willing to administer what they thought were a lethal shock to a helpless stranger and then ultimately to feel happy about what they had done. So the, it's not about, it's not that much that people are afraid of authority, uh, right? Uh, but when participating in science project or when uh, mm, some political matters, it's not about people are scared and not that much at least, or not consciously for people that they're scared of authority, they rely on it, but there is other feeling behind it that underlies it, the feeling of cooperation, that uh, they do, they undergo a certain stress, like stress of hurting others for a certain noble cause, right? So this noble cause, which for us, the science is very noble and education is very noble. And in the name of education of those, something that we trust, something that is, social cooperation and that social progress it is in the name of it that we are ready to um, to sacrifice our humanity for a bit to uh, to go through the stress of hurting hurting others it is other feeling uh, that underlies it and probably that was other feeling in um, in nazi uh, germany when people were destroying Jewish people. Probably it was same, it was done in a noble, under the pretext of a noble cause of participation of this joy in participation in something certain, uh, in something uh, socially important. And if, if this is so, and I think this is so, the tragedy is that we can't, uh, if this is the factor, the main underlying factor, the tragedy is that we can't just get rid of it because it's Big fact, right? our cooperation is the basic. This is what holds us together. Our willingness and our ability to trust others, our ability to act uh, in aim of this noble cause, uh, help others, right? Help society is what the society is grounded upon. It's just the, the main, uh, the main thing that we have, the main foundation that holds us together. And uh, tragically, it is also the other side of the of Nazism and of those of those experiments, just the willingness to participate and to sacrifice a lot. And we feel even if we have to sacrifice something, if we have to sacrifice our humanity, like hurting someone in the name of that, 
the problem is that we even we start to think of it as even to compensate maybe we start to think of it as even more even more important because it um, because we precisely because we were sacrificing a lot for it that probably means that it's so important or at least it's supposed to be so important that we uh, compromised our humanity for a moment uh, in the name of it so it's <clears throat> remember Lieberman <laughs> claiming that social need as a basic need and here we see that in those experiments in ash experiments especially in fMRI experiment experiment we are extremely social and we it's not that uh, we are social on an unconscious level we kind of have this uh, common shared consciousness and it's not um, it's not easy even to distinguish where is uh, where is our us our individuality and, and it's hard to just to rely we have this illusion that we can rely on our individual critical thinking and everything's going to be fine because um, first of all first of all it's important it's impossible to fool it's not our independent thinking it's every words that we use in our independent thinking is words uh, imposed by by society and we, we don't even think on a conscious level about it and um also we need the cooperation we need this unconscious level of cooperation of learning to create a society that's why it's very hard to to distinguish where it's uh, love gone bad and where it's a good type of love and it's even uh, maybe hard to claim that um, that there is love that is not corrupt because we never know it's not that easy to distinguish and maybe it's impossible maybe it's illusion that it's possible to distinguish maybe it's just when we're lucky and it won't turn uh, gone will not have a terrible consequences and not killing people is not enough in the uh, killing people is uh, not killing people is good parameter or us because uh, you know uh, it's because the clear um, clear definition of it. but also we have the problematic here is uh, psychological violence and uh, which as we know from Lieberman again, which might hurt even more than physical violence. And some, sometimes we do prefer that other people will hurt us, that we'll break our leg, right? Instead of uh, being rejected by someone. So with psychological violence, and it's um, now mostly when maybe we are doing better in contemporary world with physical violence and with not killing people or killing less people but the problem the other problem is that psychological violence is that uh, if it's in the uh, is, especially in online discussions uh, is uh, is active is active factor today and the last slide for today uh, that i will show it this so this is the speech of Heinrich Himmler uh, that he presented to soldiers who were actually participating in the in the destruction in elimination the program of elimination of Jewish people. Uh, he also presented it uh, as a noble noble cause in the name of noble cause, and he claimed that it testifies same as and in same feeling. So. Of course, it, it was propaganda, but that doesn't mean that it, he was since in that. Mm, same as uh, Milgram, uh, participants of Milgram experiment, they claimed that they were happy, even though they, they knew they have the hurt person, they were happy that they were participating and, and doing it uh, in the name of a noble cause. Same with those soldiers, he claimed that. Uh, mm, what what they did it was hard and uh, but they, they they still remained a good people a real man and to, to carry out this most difficult task for in a spirit of love for a german german people so it's it's hard to distinguish so what we're we going to do i will send you the the recording slides in your folder put just put the slides in your folder 
today. Uh, and we have five minutes for, for, for questions. So what we're going to do next week, I will try to, we won't, we want to find a way out as, uh, as it might seem logical from how to, like Negri and Hardu, how to distinguish, because I think it's impossible to distinguish, but um, I think it's, it's a great deal just to maybe stay pessimistic and stay more careful with ourselves and, and never relying on final guarantees and never relying on uh, mm, of just us feeling that we are 100% good because we love animals and because we love our mother or because we love uh, or because uh, because educational institution is a recognized authority there is no final guarantees and maybe just understanding that there is no, no final guarantees is the only not guarantee, but like something to be more careful, especially about yourself. Because uh, to live, to survive, we need to, there's need to have this positive bias that we are good people, just needed because it's hard to live and to think about ourselves that we are, not, we are not good. That's why all of us, we have this positive bias, but it's mostly, um, I think it's mostly about uh, like in Zimbabwe prison that proved it. It's about the circumstance, not how our knowledge is that guarantees that we we'll, won't do something wrong. It's about the circumstances and every person, like for example, Shalama uh, in Gulag, mm, those intellectuals in Gulag are um, in, con in concentration camps are a great example because they're intellectuals, right? And they're supposed to be only uh, developed people. Uh, with guarantees that they won't turn into terrible people, but the the concentration camps did turn them into such such people. And Shalama, for example, writes about this transformation, how he reflects of himself, what he's turning into. Same with prisons, right? You never know. It's more. It's not only about you. It's about the circumstances, and sometimes it's just about the accident in those circumstances that makes things go wrong and maybe just be careful about circumstances yourself and never trusting yourself others <laughs> trust no one <laughs> and uh, not sure this still will help um, but because we can be violent to other people uh, claiming that they are not careful enough or something uh, but yeah so next week we'll promise we'll try to be more will still stay pessimistic, but will maybe more optimistic a bit. Okay, so I will see you. What do you have any questions? Yes, Always. I have. Yes, there's... can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, I was absent uh, on Polina Aaron's lectures, and uh, when I just opened the recording, the, the recorder, the video, uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't. It says that. Uh, Need a password. It, that doesn't exist and I can't watch it. It happens with my uh, with my Zoom sometimes, uh, but I will maybe during this week, I want to post all of them on YouTube and I'll give you, send you new links. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so there are no more questions. I will see you on Wednesday. Be uh, ready. Can you? I'm sorry. Uh, can you uh, clarify what are we going to do next classes? Because we have a lot of presentations, and uh, yeah, uh, e even from those people who were supposed to present before the vacations. Yeah, we will try to squeeze as many presentations as we can, and also if you want to discuss Bloom, we'll have time to do it. But um, if we won't have time for everyone to make their presentation it is possible i think to have uh, some of them if you just record it and send it to us to all of us but that please let's just not not do it because it's unfair to to boast to those people who will send it because they can't the one of the points to evaluate the presentation is how people respond to questions and there are going to be no questions or well yeah and it's not the same as just presented to a class. The recording is not exactly the same. So let's just try to 
organize ourselves and squeeze all of the presentations, maybe make them shorter and discuss it for less less time. Okay. So let's have as many presentations as we can <laughs> next time. Thank you, guys. Okay, I need to go and you need to go. See you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.